It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Davenport. Thank you, Thank you Speaker. And, uh, my question is to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. It's good to see you here. Yesterday, the Minister of Education said he was tabling Bill 28 because it was in the best interest of students. Let me say, Mr. Speaker, that's pretty rich, coming from a government that has shown time and time again how little they actually care for our kids and our students. They've underfunded our schools, they've increased class sizes, they forced kids into online classes, and they kept kids out of classrooms longer than any other jurisdiction. Speaker, that is not the behaviour of a government that cares about kids, and neither is Bill 28. Order. Will the Premier stop this? roll up his sleeves and work with education workers to invest in our students. To reply, members of seat. And to reply, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're making sure that the students stay in class. I'm going to repeat that. They're going to stay in class. We want parents to know that we're doing everything we can to make sure students don't miss one single day in class. We've been at the table and we put a very fair offer and the union continues to charge ahead with a strike action that would affect this province this Friday. That means there'd be two million students sitting at home. Probably a million parents would be taking work off, Mr. Speaker. I want to be clear. We will never, ever waver from our position that students remain in the class, catching up with their learning, surrounded by friends with a full school experience, including extracurricular activities. It's good to hear the Premier finally get allowed to speak uh, by his government there. I, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, Friday, Kids are going to be out of school in many parts of this province because your government is going to disrupt that. Order. Ontarians want to know why this government premier side come is order. not standing up for the custodians and the maintenance workers who are keeping side come our order. schools clean and safe, or the educational assistants supporting our students with special needs, or the ECEs that are teaching our littlest kids. Speaker, this government, they have all the power and the privilege. All these workers have is their union and their right to bargain collectively. It is not too late. Fix the mess you're making today. Order. Will the Premier speak up and stop this bill? Remind the members to make their comments to the chair. The Premier. M Mr. Speaker, there's only one party in this chamber that is standing up for students and parents, and that's the PC party. The Liberals, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals and NDP, they want to make sure they stand up for the heads of the Order. union. Mr. Speaker, our party differentiates between Labour and Labour leadership. We support the frontline Labour folks. Mr. Speaker, we support, we, we support the fact that the frontline folks get 131 days. We're okay with that, of sick days. But what we don't support is the unreasonable request from QP leadership that they demand a nearly 50 per cent increase. A 50 per cent increase. Mr. Speaker, the union refuses to withdraw their strike notice even after we put forward a very generous offer. We've already Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, this government, and back to the Premier, this government is violating the rights of 55,000 Ontario workers, and those workers are parents too. Newsflash. Bill 28 is going to hurt them and it's going to hurt their families. There is no notwithstanding clause for workers who can't afford to pay their bills. The Premier is forcing these workers to accept a shameful deal while they starve our classrooms and they're sitting on billions of education dollars at the same time. And you know the irony, Mr. Speaker, the irony is that this bill, this government, is going to force the education workers out. That's what's going to do it. This bill is going to close our schools. This bill right here 
Will the Premier stop coming after workers, tear up this terrible bill, and Order. return to the bargaining table today? The Premier. Mr. Speaker, I ask the opposition, stop attacking and going after our students, stop going after our parents, stop going after the two million students that want to be in the classroom, Mr. Speaker. They talk about 54,000 workers. Order. We're talking over a million parents that would take work off because you want to feather the nest of the heads of the union. That's unacceptable. We want to take care of the frontline, hardworking, educational workers, and we'll Opposition always have their backs. Order. But you know something? We, we are going to be feathering the nest of the head of the QP. Again, we differentiate between labour and labour leadership. They, I think the Labour needs to find new Labour leadership. I realize members care passionately and deeply about this issue. But I need to be able to hear the member who has the floor. And I'll ask the House to come to order. Start the clock. The next question. Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Uh, but before I ask, I'll just assure the Premier that the members of those unions who are providing our children with support today, they want what has been put forward. And any suggestion that their wishes aren't being represented is simply not accurate. <laughs> Speaker, education workers are critical to our schools. They're the librarians who help our kids develop a love of reading. They're the educational assistants who go above and beyond to help those children who are dealing with disabilities. They're the secretaries who keep our schools running. But instead of valuing these workers and paying them a fair wage, listening to what they want and actually meeting them at a fair point, the government is determined to drive them right out of our schools. Why does the government have such a hard time recognizing the important role education workers play in our schools? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. While the NDP and the Liberals sit on the sidelines, this government will stand up for students and keep them in class. That is what a responsible government would do. Mr. Speaker, we believe in a simple principle, as communicated by the Premier, that children should be in the classroom. It has been very difficult past few years started with strikes followed by a border pandemic we have a moral obligation to ensure they are in school in front of their teachers with their friends learning skills not at home on a friday or any day this school year we've been very clear in our intention to stand up for students for parents and ensure they're in school every day speaker yeah. the supplementary question the leader of his majesty's loyal opposition again to the premier and speaker Let's be clear, if this government cared about the children in our schools, they wouldn't beat up on the people we're looking after. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday was a dark day for Ontario workers. Bill 28 not only disrespects education workers, but it also tramples their collective bargaining rights by imposing a contract, denying them the right to strike, and levying fines against those who dare defy the Premier's orders. This government's use of the notwithstanding clause is massive overreach. A clear message to workers that their concerns just don't matter. New Democrats call on this government to reverse course, withdraw Bill 28, and return to the bargaining table to bargain in actual good faith. Will the government commit to doing that today? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the members opposite can have it both ways. Either you support this strike or you stand with this government and will vote for this bill and keep kids in the classroom. Pick a lane. 
The NDP wants to the NDP wants to have it both ways, and they simply can't. They need to declare a clear position to the constituents in their ridings. Will they vote for this bill that provides stability for children, or will they stand with this unit on a strike that no one will tolerate Order. in the province of Ontario? Final supplementary, the member for Nickelbelt. Bill 28 is intimidation, is bullying for education workers. Those uh, workers have already a very bad uh, um, salaries. They go use f food banks, and our children are the ones who will pay. The Premier will create a humanitarian crisis in our schools, as they did before, uh, with people who have low salaries. Will the pr Premier pull back and support the education workers and come back to the negotiation table? Thank you, the member opposite, for the question. We are very committed to keeping kids in school. We've heard from the voices of parents who have told us the difficulty and the hardship they have faced with respect to the pandemic and the strikes that preceded it just a few short years ago. Mr. Speaker, while we remain committed to getting a deal with any willing partner in education to provide stability, Order. we will not tolerate impacts on kids. We will not accept a child being out of school for even one day. We're taking action to stand up for children while we continue in good faith with our Labour partners to get a deal so that we can all we can all bring forth a program that is fair for workers whom we respect. It's why we're hiring 1,800 more of them in this program. It's why this progressive Conservative government has hired 7,000, nearly 7,000 more education workers to date in our schools. But, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue our work, listen to parents, stand up for students, and keep these kids in school. I realize this is out of order, but uh, I want to welcome the school children who are here in East and West Public Galleries. We're glad to have you here to observe question period. And I know that all members will join me in wanting to impress those school children today. <laughs> Start the clock. The next question, member for Ottawa West Nepean. Education workers help our students every day. They kept schools going even when they closed. They love their work. They want to continue supporting students. And they, but they want to pay their bills at the same time. Bill, the government will attack such important workers that and uh, cannot uh, pay their bills. Why does the premier force to uh, recourse uh, at the bill rather than negotiate with these uh, workers in a reasonable way? Mr. Speaker, it was just Sunday where we brought the union in a room to discuss an option to avert a strike, which QP alone called Effective Friday. They put this province with five days' notice of a province-wide strike impacting two million children. Member for it Davenport, is, come to order. Member for Niagara position, Falls, come to order. It is our position, Speaker, that is unacceptable and inconsistent with the advice of parents who want their kids in the classroom. We agree. We understand the hardship this pandemic has imposed on kids and working parents. And we believe they should be in school. They should be with their educators. They should be with their friends. That should be a position supported by every member in this legislature. And the Premier is right. We stand alone on this issue, and we will fight every day to ensure these kids remain in school. The supplementary question. We don't support kids by sending their grown-ups to a food bank. Crystal, who lives in Ottawa, West Nepean, is a library tech, supporting over 600 kids at two different schools. She works long, exhausting days, then comes home to a diet of canned beans and rice because that's all she can afford. She does yard duty in shoes with holes in them because she can't afford to replace them. She still loves her job, and she can't fathom doing anything else, but this government is driving workers like Crystal away. Instead of trampling on the rights of workers like Crystal, will the Prime, Minister, the Premier actually step up to support Crystal and the 620 kids she supports by scrapping this shameful bill and coming to the table to negotiate a fair deal? Mr. Education. 
Mr. Speaker, we remain entirely committed to keeping children in school. We believe these kids have paid a great price of the pandemic, and I think it's absolutely responsible for this government to stand up and ensure they remain in class right to June without disruption. That is the obligation we have to families. We've received a mandate from the people of this province to speak for these kids, give them a voice. We committed in the summer to a normal and stable return to class, and we are fulfilling that through this legislation, which we hope will pass design to provide stability for the kids of this province. Speaker. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, Ontario's housing supply is in a crisis. Housing was the leading issue of concern during the, uh, the provincial and the municipal election. We share these concerns with our members opposite. We have often claimed to advocate for missing middle housing and to increase the supply of uh, alternative and affordable housing in the province of Ontario. The issue of addressing the housing situation in our province transcends party lines and requires immediate action, as the status quo is not working. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the bold and decisive actions of our government is taking to address the concerns related to housing supply? Speaker, uh, I want to thank the member for Mississauga Lakeshore for that question. Uh, he's absolutely right. We we know that the status quo is not working. Uh, the members opposite have even acknowledged uh, that fact. But if we continue, Speaker, down the path that this province has been on, there is going to be a generation that will never realize the dream of home ownership. The proposed legislation uh, takes several very important steps to make sure that Ontario has the additional housing supply it needs by permitting more gentle intensification through allowing three units as of right, our proposed changes will lay the foundation for more missing middle housing. Additionally, we're reducing building costs to incentivize the construction of Spons? affordable housing, not-for-profit housing, inclusionary zoning units right across this province. What we're asking is that the opposition put partnership over partisanship and stop— Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and, and Minister, for that response. I'm sure that all members of this House have received questions and concerns from the people of their riding regarding what our government is doing to help individuals and families achieve the dream of home ownership. I know our government is committed to delivering on our mandate of building 1.5 million homes over the next decade. We all agree that the government must take bold and decisive actions to help those who feel left behind in the housing market. Speaker, can the minister please explain how this legislation will help Ontarians and newcomers and young first-time buyers realize their dream of home ownership? Minister of Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. And again, I want to I want to thank the member for Miss Sog Lakeshore. He's a, a true home believer and a true champion for uh, housing in his riding. Um, you know, our government, Speaker, is making sure that first-time home buyers have access to the homes that they can afford. It's imperative that we use every tool that's available to us, including the creation of our new attainable housing program. It's going to reduce costs on affordable housing. It's going to parcel surplus provincial lands, take advantage of innovative technologies, and also alternate uh, housing ownership models. Speaker, Ontarians need and they deserve the peace of mind when it comes to making the biggest purchase in their life. That's why I was proud last week uh, to uh, stand with uh, uh, Minister Rashid, the Minister of uh, Public Business and Service Delivery, as we introduced Response. the strictest consumer protection in Canada. Speaker, the opposition was right when they said we need an all-hands-on-deck. We just need them to change their approach. They have to start saying yes to creating new housing supply. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is the Premier. Good morning, Premier. I want to tell you about Daniel Rancourt, uh, Speaker. He's an education support worker. His dedication to our children is absolutely immense. For 29 years, Daniel's kept our schools clean and safe for students and for staff, Speaker. Unfortunately, his child has type 1 diabetes, and that requires medication and medical supplies. And covering the cost of those necessary medical supplies is a huge struggle for Daniel. Speaker, workers who are working 12 hours a day, five days a week, should be able to afford necessary medical expenses for their child. But Daniel said, and I quote, 
Put yourself in our shoes. With the rising cost of living, would you be able to live off of our salary? This, Mr. Ford and Mr. Lecce, I'm quoting, means that as a father and a husband, I don't get to spend a lot of time at home. My question, Speaker, will the Premier scrap this harmful bill, finally acknowledge the lives and struggle of the education support workers they're hurting, and direct his minister to sit down and finally negotiate a fair deal? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to keeping kids in the classroom. That is our priority. That is what is driving this legislation. It is why we are here today, because a QP has decided on Sunday to announce a five-day strike. QP alone put themselves on this footing. After all, Speaker, it was QP who decided to proceed with a strike mandate even before the government tabled our first offer in the summer. This was their intention all along, and it is regrettable we are here. We shouldn't be here. We should have had a voluntary deal signed on Sunday that preserves stability and offer a reasonable offer to the workers, 10 per cent over four years, maintaining the benefits, the pensions, the sick leave, which we believe is competitive. Mr. Speaker, 11 days paid at 100 per cent and 120 days at 90 per cent, the only of a program of its kind in the country, Speaker. Order. Mr. Speaker, our commitment is to preserve those benefits, to incent more of them to work, and to ensure they show up on Friday because our kids are depending on them to Response. be there every day in this province. Yeah. Question. Mr. Speaker, it would be lovely to hear from the Premier. The Premier was talking about supporting frontline folks. I want to remind you that 96.5 per cent of those workers voted with the union and agreed with the negotiations. Let me tell you about charity. I keep telling the Premier Speaker about charity. She's a full-time education support worker who earns so little from the Conservative government that she goes to food banks. Yesterday, I asked a question about it, got ignored by the Premier. I hope we get an answer today. So, Charity doesn't understand why the Conservative government continues to attack workers like her. She called me yesterday and she said, I am so scared right now. I'm honestly terrified. My kids are wearing the same Halloween costumes from last year because we couldn't afford new ones. I just want to go grocery shopping. We deserve better than the food bank. Speaker, will the Premier finally answer and tell Charity why he doesn't care about her children or about workers like her? Let's get an answer. Education. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, the members opposite. I think the Premier and every member of this, of this Progressive Conservative Party is committed to ensuring Charity's children could be in school. That is the first obligation of this province. It is our responsibility to ensure these kids Order. have stability. Because children in Ontario and families in this province have seen this story before. The never-ending strikes imposed under successive Premiers, under different parties, and parents have had Order. enough. That's why, Speaker, we brought forth the bill with regret, knowing that there was an option for the union. Withdraw the strike and proceed with negotiations with the government. But they opted to proceed with this strike that no one wants, that will impose hardship on children. And the government has been clear on our obligation. We will ensure kids are in school. We will work every day to ensure they catch up. And that, Speaker, starts with them being in class in the first place. That's why, Speaker, we were prepared to meet with the uh, negotiating team at any point so long as strikes Response. are off the table in this province, Speaker. Thank you very much. I recognize the member for, apologize, New Market Aurora. Speaker, experts are projecting that Ontario's population is expected to increase by two to six million over the next 20 years. Wow. As many newcomers arrive in Ontario, in communities like mine, Newmarket Aurora, York Region is viewed as a favourable jurisdiction to settle down, raise a family and own a home. Many of my constituents have settled in this area and to meet the future needs of my community's growing population, our government must ensure environmentally sustainable growth for the great people of York Region. Under the previous Liberal government, we saw how they chose to dither, delay and neglect when it came to proper environmental planning and housing development for my region. Speaker, can the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks please explain what our government is doing for housing development in York Region? Great. Mr. The Environment, Conservation and Parks. To thank the member opposite for her leadership and advocacy, but to support a critical need housing. You know, we heard it through the last election, and we know that our municipal counterparts heard it through theirs. For years, Ontarians have struggled for, to find attainable home ownership. 
parents and grandparents looking in the eyes of their children, wondering if they'll ever have a place to call home. And if we're going to be honest with ourselves, Speaker, that means we need to build the critical infrastructure to support that housing growth. Simply put, Ontarians deserve reliability and strong environmental oversight for simple actions like turning the faucet on or flushing the toilet. It's not sexy, Speaker, I know, but for years, the previous Liberal government ignored this critical infrastructure needed to give people the dignity of a roof over their home and a place to call home. And for years, these regions struggled to meet their population growth numbers because of neglect by the previous Liberal government. Well, I'm proud to say that under the leadership of this Premier and this Minister of Housing, we're solving Response. this problem. We're getting shovels in ground on the roads, the bridges, the houses, and yes, the critical water and wastewater infrastructure needed so that people can have a place to call home in the province of Ontario. Speaker, it's great to hear from the minister about our government's actions on this file, which is of vital importance for the people of my riding. York Region has awaited on an answer to its Upper York Sewage Solutions proposal since 2014, and I know that our government has been steadfast in working on this file since we came to government. Speaker, our government assigned the York Region Wastewater Independent Advisory Panel to consider options regarding addressing wastewater solutions for the future. The panel has now published a report backing the Duffin Creek Treatment Facility for Wastewater Management. Question. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how this decision was made and why this is the right choice for all of Ontario and my community of Newmarket Aurora in the great region of York. Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for that important question. I would like to thank the incredible work of the panel. Um, Speaker, they've worked hard over the last year to provide a sage advice to this government. That advice is now public uh, for all Ontarians to see, and I'd like to thank them for that work. Speaker, they've put forward advice that is best for the environment. 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, thanks to the advice and, and work that this panel do, uh, has done. Secondly, Speaker, it's better for cost. They've saved over $800 million for the ratepayers of York Region, providing certainty for both York and Durham Region so that folks can have a place to call home, not just today, but for years to come. And finally, Speaker, they've done the important work of looking at optimizing existing infrastructure. And, Speaker, they've done excellent work, and that's why our Spons. ministry is here, providing certainty for both regions to support the growth, working with Indigenous partners on, uh, to meet important duty to consult um, requirements. And, Speaker, we're getting the job done. Thank you. The next question, the member from Toronto, St. Paul. Thank you. This question is to the Premier. The Conservative government introduced back-to-work legislation that disregards the value of 55,000 QP frontline education workers in our schools, many of them the lowest paid workers in education who are disproportionately women and BIPOC people. This government legislation blocks workers' bargaining rights, charter and human rights. Speaker, these are workers who make, up, uh, make an average of $39,000 a year as custodians, bus drivers, librarians, education assistants, supporting students with disabilities and behaviorals, lunchroom supervisors, hall monitors and early childhood educators. They are also parents. My question is to the Premier. The Premier's salary is over $208,000 uh, $208, a year. The Minister of Ed is over $165,000 a year. Their salaries keep going up despite inflation. Why does the Premier and the Minister think their work is four times, Order. five times more valuable than education workers Question. caring for Ontario's children in our schools? Why are PCs paying education workers below inflation? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we're committed to keeping kids in the classroom where they belong. We think that is the priority of all parents in this province who have seen the hardship, the disruption, and the regression in learning, in mental and physical health, and social-emotional well-being. 
We have to stand up for these kids and give them a voice in this debate. They have been on the sidelines for too long. They've been in, these strikes have been imposed on them for over 30 to 40 years, and I think it's absolutely appropriate for the government to use every tool at our disposal to ensure stability and to protect the in-class learning experience these kids deserve in Ontario. That's a question. Governments keeping students in class act will not keep students in class. It is bad legislation that disregards parents like Candace in my community who might have to struggle to find unaffordable childcare if education workers are forced to strike. This preemptive strike legislation, similar to Conservative Bill 124 that produced a mass exodus of nurses from health care, will push education workers out the door never to return. Speaker, you cannot keep students in class without the caring adults, the education workers who are the backbone of our education system, helping them every step of the way. My question is back to the Premier. Nice to see you today. Will you stop this attack on education workers, get back to the bargaining table, and honour our students, our, for our future leaders, question. and education workers with a fair deal? 39K is not enough. Thank you. I remind members to please make their comments through the chair, not across the floor. That was directly reply. The Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we believe very strongly that children should be in school. I think this discussion, this debate is often about salaries, benefits, sick leave and entitlements. Why don't we start talking about the impact to kids in this province? The impact to children's mental and physical health. For Ottawa the South come to order. loss that they feel at home when they're not Remember in front of their educators. St. Paul's come to order. We believe strongly that kids should be in school. We've increased investments in public education at the highest levels recorded Ever. in the history of Ontario, 680 million more dollars. But in addition to the investments and the 7,000 more education staff we've hired since we came to power, we believe as the first principle of our plan to catch up kids have to be in school, and that's what we're fighting for. It's why we brought forth this bill in response to a union, CUPE, who's response. put themselves on a path to a strike this Friday. We will do what is right to keep these kids in school. The next question, the member for Guelph. My question is for the Premier, and I want to be clear. I want students back in school in clean, safe, So I need to remind the House that I have to hear the member who has the floor. I think he's got more to say. Start the clock. The member for Guelph. Back in clean, safe classrooms in a stable, supportive learning environment. But, Speaker, let's be clear, that will not happen if the government continues to attack the charter rights of the lowest paid education workers in this province, people trying to survive on $39,000 a year. It's challenging for workers to give students all they can when they're having to work second jobs and go to the food bank to even put food on the table. So, Speaker, we are experiencing the negative consequences of Bill 124, underpaying and disrespecting frontline health care workers in our health care system. So why would the government repeat the same mistakes in our education system? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are absolutely committed to standing up to ensure kids remain in school. Mr. Speaker, I will note to the member opposite that uh, education workers in this country here in Ontario are paid the highest, $27 an hour. They have benefits. They have the best pension. They have 131 paid sick days, part of their sick leave. And as you know, Speaker, we continue to provide more investment in schools, more staffing. Part of this contract has proposed 1,800 more workers to ensure our kids are better supported. What we will not accept is the idea of children being out of class Order. for even one more day. They have paid the price of this pandemic, and we have a responsibility Opposition to, come to, order. to ensure they stay in school, in front of their educators, learning the skills they need to succeed in this economy. Speaker. Supplementary question. Speaker, Bill 28 doesn't work for workers, doesn't work for students. 
If the government was serious about standing up for students, they would stand up for the people who care for those students. They would stand up for the people who go in each and every day at very low pay to ensure that our schools are safe, they're clean, that our students have extra education support. So I want to say to the parents of this province, if you want your students to be in safe, stable classrooms with good learning environments, then the government needs to negotiate fair wages with the lowest paid workers. So my question, Speaker, to the minister is, why is the government refusing to negotiate in a reasonable, fair way with low-paid education workers asking for a few extra dollars an hour to question. be able to pay the bills? Minister of Education. Speaker, it's neither reasonable or fair to announce a strike on Friday when children have already been out of class, they've already been dealing with the pandemic and the strikes before that. That is unfair to children, and we believe Order. in our judgment that kids should be in school. They should be in a stable, safe environment, supported by their staff and with their friends. That's why, Speaker, we've increased investment in public education. It's why we've offered a better deal with 10 per cent over four years while maintaining those benefits and pensions I spoke of earlier. We are doing this because we want to get to a deal. It requires the union to withdraw the strike. It requires the union to bring forth a reasonable offer, not a nearly 33 per cent increase in salary, nearly 50 per cent increase in compensation when you add it all up. That is not reasonable to any observer. We're going to continue to work hard and stand up for kids and keep them in school, Speaker. Next question, member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, communities across eastern Ontario have been ignored for far too long under the previous Liberal government when it came to providing access to reliable high-speed internet. As a former IT guy and a former member of the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus, I am very aware of both the need and the efforts of, of the local people have put into accessing broadband. Residents and businesses rely on reliable internet systems for their day-to-day -day work, for children to learn, and for residents to communicate with people across the world, among many other things. For those in remote and rural communities, the continued lack of reliable internet services prevents many from achieving their full economic potential. Our government recently made an announcement highlighting the investments made in high-speed internet infrastructure. Speaker, can the Minister of Infrastructure please update the Legislature on how our government is closing the digital divide for all Ontarians, no matter where they live? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you to the member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington for the question. Mr. Speaker, we are allocating $4 billion to connect every Ontarian to high-speed internet by the Four end billion. of 2025. Last week, my parliamentary assistant, member from Brampton West, jo joined the federal government to announce an investment of $56 million towards high-speed internet connectivity in eastern Ontario. Powered by Bell and Kojiko, these three projects will bring access to Birds Creek, Buckhorn and Bob Cajun. Bell's projects are set to be completed by December 2025, and Kojiko's project is set to be completed by March 2024. Mr. Speaker, this investment in high-speed internet means that 16,000 homes will now have access. Here, here. Supplementary question. Hey, Mr. Speaker, this is great news for families and businesses across eastern Ontario. Access to reliable internet should be a necessity, not a luxury. Unfortunately, this is still not the case for many Ontario families, including many of my constituents. Speaker, as the minister previously noted, our government has a plan to bring high-speed broadband access to every Ontarian by 2025. Speaker, can the Minister of Infrastructure please explain how our government plans to close this gap and achieve the goal of 100 per cent connectivity for all Ontarians, especially those in rural Ontario? Minister of Infrastructure. Question. The member is correct. Our government has made a commitment to be, bring high-speed internet access to every Ontarian by the end of 2025. We have already invested over $950 million towards nearly 190 high-speed internet projects that have connected roughly 375,000 homes and businesses, which also include premises in eastern Ontario. 
This summer, we announced the eight successful internet service providers from the reverse auction process. These eight ISPs are bringing access to up to 266,000 underserved and unserved homes and businesses within 339 municipalities. We are now focusing uh, on our last mile strategy to close the digital divide. We have 40 to 60 thousand premises to go. We are almost there, but our government will get the job done. That's a lot. <laughs> Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, this Premier and his government decided to take away bargaining rights of education workers who are among some of the lowest paid unionized workers in Ontario. My office spoke with an education worker who called his action undemocratic and unfair. Speaker, why is the Premier and his government refusing to respect workers' rights and bargain a fair collective agreement? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we respect our workers, which is why we're increasing their pay every year over the course of this contract, 10 per cent over four years, maintaining benefits, sick leave, and, of course, pensions, the gold standard in Canada. They are paid the highest in Canada, $27 an hour on average. We're increasing their pay. We'll continue to do so because we know they play a critical role in our schools. Part of our program is to hire 1,800 more education workers and roughly 800 to 900 more teachers. That's what we're doing because we know education quality is paramount. We know learning loss is real. We've expanded tutoring, $175 million. We've hired more staff. We've expanded training. But, Mr. Speaker, none of this really matters unless these kids are in class. That's why we brought forth this legislation. Really, it's a last resort to ensure kids have the stability they deserve. Supplementary. Speaker, the last resort would have been bargaining until midnight on Thursday when this, when this agreement was up on Friday. That would have been the last resort. Education workers in this province deserve better from this government. Investing in our educational worker, workers means investing in our children's futures, because without them, our children are set up for failure. The education workers who are being disrespected by, the government, by this government are the same workers who keep our schools clean and functioning properly. They need an environment that is safe, and without them, that can't happen. Why does this Premier think that it's not important to invest in our children's futures? Mr. Speaker, we think it's important to stand up for students' futures, which is why we brought forth the bill today to keep them in school, because there's another threat of a strike that only one party made in this province, and that's the QP on Sunday when they announced the strike on Friday. Now, the member opposite suggests there's another way. Yes, of course, government could have, as the New Democrats have, I guess, officially tabled their position, not introduced legislation, hoped for the best on Thursday. And if the government of the day didn't acquiesce to a nearly 50 percent increase in compensation, there would have been a strike on Friday. How Order. is that good for kids, for parents, and for the communities that depend on our publicly funded schools? We have done this as a last resort because, regrettably, the union wouldn't withdraw the strike on, on Friday. And we don't believe kids should be out of school. We believe these children have been through enough. And enough is enough, Speaker. Parents know this to be true. We're Response. standing up to provide the stability every child in this province deserves. Next question. The member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. As we know, Ontario's health care system is in crisis. And to be fair, health care has been in disaster mode for a long time. But you are the government of the day, and it's up to you to fix it. Speaker, this government must restore respect by scrapping Bill 124, a bill that continues to gut our system of nurses. It's time to clean up surgical backlogs by setting up standalone centres, and I've spoken to many retired nurses who believe returning to a two-year college nursing program would get more people on the front lines faster. That's part of a plan, and yet all I hear and see from this government on this file is tinkering. Healthcare workers have lost faith in their profession, and they've left. They continue to leave, and others have been sidelined. I haven't seen any action with respect to enticing health care workers back to the front line. Speaker, as we watch Ontario's hospitals bleed out, does the minister, what does the minister have to say to those who've lost faith or who have been forced to watch from the sidelines? Minister of Health and Deputy Premier. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I'm always happy to talk about our plan to stay open. It is, frankly, a very important tenet of how we are making sure that our hospitals, that our long-term care, that our community care 
are working at full capacity so that they can look after the individuals who need help where they need it, when they need it. You know, we have worked very well with the College of Nurses of Ontario. In fact, uh, we have over 1,000 new internationally educated uh, RNs who are licensed and practicing in the province of Ontario because of the changes that our government has made. The member opposite is right on one point. The member opposite is right on one point, and that is that this file was ignored for far too long. We have Auditor General reports saying that we had a shortage of family physicians in Northern Ontario. Did the government of the day do anything? No. It took Premier Ford, it took this government to act and make the changes needed to make sure that our health care system is protected. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, that response is a bit disappointing because the member opposite should have said she will do everything possible to get every qualified worker back on the front lines. We need them all, and we need them today. <laughs> Sunday night, one of my local hospitals, Norfolk General, issued a statement that effective immediately, services in the emergency department would be temporarily reduced. Speaker, this is a staffing issue, and we're just at the beginning of cold and flu season. The release issued by the hospital said, and I quote, that this temporary reduction in hours is necessary and is beyond the control of the hospital and the physicians in our community. This means the buck stops with the minister, with this government. Over the past 36 hours, my constituents have been reaching out to me. They are worried they are going to see more of these reductions in the coming weeks and months. Speaker, will the minister stand up today and tell every qualified health care worker she will do everything possible to get them all back Question. to work in Haldeman, Norfolk, and in all hospitals across Ontario to avoid further reductions and shutdowns? Minister Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, this question gives me an opportunity to highlight some of the things that have already occurred as we talk about short, medium, and long-term goals. You know, we have, with our plan to stay open, uh, added over 6,000 more health care workers, including nurses and personal support workers to Ontario's health resource workforce. We will free up 2,500 hospital beds so that care is there for those who need it. And we will expand models of care that provide better, more appropriate care to avoid unnecessary visits to emergency departments. There is no doubt that our government is seized with this issue. It is happening internationally, across other countries, across Canadian jurisdictions, to make sure that we have the sufficient health human resources. But we're doing the work here Fonts. in Ontario to make sure that people who want to practice and work in the health care system have that opportunity here in Ontario. Next, the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long Term Care. Speaker, for years, the Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, neglected our seniors living in long term care. The Liberals received countless reports, including the Sharkey Report, which called for increased direct care hours for residents. Despite this, between 2009 and 18, they only increased care by an average of two minutes per year leaving our seniors well below the recommended four hours of daily care. Speaker, what is our government doing to improve care for seniors? Therefore, Lanark from uh, Kingston, the Parliamentary Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Chatham-Kent, Leamington, for the question. Uh, this government has listened to the advice of health care experts. We are increasing year after year and ensuring long-term care residents receive an average of four hours of care per day by March 2025. This is up from two and a half hours in 2018. To meet this target, we are providing $4.9 billion in funding over four years, which will help homes hire 27,000 new nurses and personal support workers. 27,000. Improving staffing is one of our three key pillars for fixing long-term care, and we are making historic investments to ensure our long-term care residents receive the care they deserve. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for responding. Our government recently announced the hiring more nurse practitioners for long-term care program. The announcement noted that our government would commit $57 million over three years to recruit and retain up to 225 
additional nurse practitioners for the long-term care sector. Speaker, could the minister explain the role of nurse practitioners and how this will impact the operation of long-term care homes across the province? And further, Speaker, could the minister elaborate further what support we'll provide to remote and rural communities with less access to health care workers? Thank you, for Leonard, for thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you for the member again for the question, because I'm a big fan of nurse practitioners, and I believe they're a big answer to uh, relieving some of the strains on our health care system. And their scope includes diagnosing conditions, ordering tests and prescribing medications, developing comprehensive care plans, and making referrals when required. That's just some of the things within their scope. Through this program, homes and requests can request funding for eligible employment expenses, including salaries, benefits, and overhead costs for newly hired nurse practitioners. And this is an important step toward enhancing the quality of care in long-term care homes. Nurse practitioners are part of a health care team that develops, supports, implements, and evaluates residents' care plans. They also provide mentorship to other staff, enhancing their knowledge and abilities. We also recognize that rural communities may have trouble accessing much-needed health care professionals, Spons? which is why this funding also provides up to $5,000 to help nurse practitioners relocate. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Education workers are early childhood educators and educational assistants, custodians and administrators. Schools literally wouldn't function without them. Tens of thousands of women and men who do these jobs every day are the lowest paid workers in our education system. They show up every day and work hard so our children can have the best education possible. The Premier always talks about being there for the little guy. He talks about how he's always working for workers. My question is, how about putting all of that talk into action? Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are acting to keep kids in school. It's why we brought forth a bill today to do that in response to QP's decision to strike on Friday, which we think is really regrettable and frankly unfair to these kids who have been through so much difficulty. Now, Mr. Speaker, we do agree with the member that we value these workers. It's why in this contract we're suggesting and proposing up to 10 per cent over four years, an increase of their pay and benefits, and maintaining their, uh, their pension program and 131 days of sick leave. Mr. Speaker, we've done this deliberately because we recognize the critical role they play in our schools. We're going to be hiring 1,800 more education workers and up to 800 more teachers in our schools to support our kids. Mr. Speaker, while we increase funding and increase staffing in our schools, the first principle of helping these kids catch up really is that they got to be in school Friday and every day. That's why we brought this bill in reaction to CUPE's decision to strike, and we hope they will withdraw this needless and unfair strike on children and return to work with government to get a better deal, a better way that it respects all players but keeps these kids in the classroom. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. The previous Liberal government tried imposing contracts on workers before with Bill 115. The, court, the courts ruled that violated the charter rights of teachers and the government was required to pay over $200 million in penalties. We know what will happen after this government imposes contracts on education workers. They will be taken to court, which they will fight with tax dollars, and then they will lose and have to pay huge penalties. That's not fiscally responsible. Why is the Premier wasting tax dollars in the courts instead of paying education workers what they're worth? Mr. Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're increasing investments in public education by $680 million. We've announced Ontario's plan to catch up, which has over $175 million of tutoring. We've increased staffing in the province of Ontario. No, it's in person, in fact, Mr. Speaker. Small groups under five on average in every uh, school board in the province of Ontario. And we extended it next year, Speaker, because we think that is so critical, because learning loss is a root cause. Uh, really created by disruption, by kids being out of school and impacted by pandemics or strikes or other difficulty. Mr. Speaker, we want to see none of that transpire. We want these kids to stay in school, to stay calm and focused on learning and not be impacted by needless disruption when one puts their own interests ahead of the collective interests of kids. We are going to fight hard to keep kids in school, and we hope the members opposite will join us in supporting stability for all children in the province of Ontario. 
The next question, the member for Cambridge. Speaker, I'm pleased to welcome the egg farmers of Ontario who have joined us here today. Because of the sacrifice and hard work of nearly 500 egg farm families in Ontario, they provide up to half the eggs sold in Canada. An amazing feat. Our egg uh, food sector is a vital industry for our province and for the country's economic future. Unfortunately, many of these farmers require more support due to the need for greater access to egg technology. For Ontario farmers to grow and become more efficient, they need a provincial government that understands the value of investing in ag tech innovation. Here, here. Speaker, can the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs please tell the House about the targeted investments for our government is making to get the, the latest ag tech technology into the hand of our, hands of our farmers, please? <laughs> Mr. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much to the member opposite from Cambridge for that question, because I, I want to share with you, Speaker, that through the leadership of Premier Ford and the commitment of our government, some of the most advanced agri-food research around the world is happening right here in Ontario. We're investing in research stations positioned strategically throughout the province, like in Emo in northwestern Ontario. They're seeing if the crop of hops can grow. We have research stations that farmers and government are like are partnering on, like we have in Alora. And we also are investing $7 million in over 50 Ontario-led research projects facilitated through institutions like the University of Guelph, focused on environmental stewardship, animal and plant health, as well as rural economic development. We have greenhouse growers developing initiatives that are going to see net zero energy Response. greenhouses. We're putting digital soil mapping into the hands of farmers and speaker. We are also bringing agritech forward with the adoption of new innovations, automation and robotics. Wow. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Speaker, unfortunately, many farmers were not supported by the previous Liberal government no. when responding to the needs of our agricultural sector. And this is why our government must take immediate action and correct this. Roughly one in 10 jobs in the province are connected to the farming and ag food sector. There is no denying this has been a challenging year for farmers. Global supply chains have been disrupted and continue to impact the inputs they rely on. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government supports innovation and solutions to strengthen egg food supply chains through this new technology. Mr. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. There's no denying, there's no denying, Speaker, that the supply chain challenges over the last couple of years have, have ultimately put farmers in a precarious situation. But again, under the vision of Premier Ford, new doors for new, innovative, made-in-Ontario solutions have been opened. And I'm pleased to share with you an example that really has hit home, because we're wanting to inspire and invite and incentivize companies to invest in Ontario for Ontario-led solutions, like the fertilizer challenge that we opened up. And we're inviting people to bring forward ideas to introduce new opportunities for fertilizer that has been made right here in Ontario. You know, when we come up with alternatives like fertilizer solutions right here in this province of Ontario, our farmers will be the early adopters. And what does that generate? It generates confidence, consumer confidence in their food source. Nutritious, delicious, growing right here close at home. So, Speaker, in closing, I just want to share with you that it is our government that's standing shoulder to shoulder with our farmers, with our food processors, and with our innovators to make sure we're leading edge and everyone. Thank you very much. Next question, the member from London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is the, to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. A good society makes sure that kids have every advantage. Rather than enhancing young Ontarians' education through investment, this government is admitting failure and is changing the rules because they can't negotiate a fair deal. Mm -hmm. This government is teaching children that being fair is optional. What is this government thinking about their impact teaching children about ethics and values? This government wants to distract people from realizing they pay educational support workers around minimum wage. Minimum wages for those who look after our children. 
When will this government enhance education, listen to workers, and finally pay them what they're worth? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, yet again, another question without any concern for kids' strikes on Friday, which is really regrettable and, frankly, unacceptable to parents and to children across the, country, across the province who want to see stability for their children. We believe kids should be in school. We've offered the union a off-ramp to avert a strike by meeting Sunday to withdraw the strike notice that it will impact 2 million kids this Friday, but they rejected that. They continue on their path to strike, and that is really unfair to so many kids who've been through so much. And so, Speaker, we've brought forth legislation that is before the House. We encourage the member opposite to vote for it on the basis that children in London and in every region of this province deserve to be in class. Supplementary question. You know, it's no surprise, Speaker, when well, my question is back to the Premier, that the Minister of Education really could not talk to the, the moral and ethical accountability of this government and not abiding with fairness in negotiation. You know, they talk about their good business acumen, yet they can't negotiate. They can't close a deal. They have to bring a hammer when they don't actually need one. Children know when someone is being manipulative and unfair. They also know what it's like when someone is being a bully. Listen to the front lines, the people who care for our children. As ECE Janet wrote to me, multiple class evacuations disrupt our days and our learning, and our school has five EAs running around with their heads chopped off through the whole school. The system is breaking. Staff can't afford to stay and will leave if, because of Lecce and Ford's decision to mandate legislation. Is this government going to keep strangling the education system through cuts, underfunding, and neglect, or will they show the children are important by paying education support workers what they deserve and truly invest in public education. Yeah. I'm going to remind members that even when they're quoting from a document, it would be preferable if they would refer to the ministers by their ministerial title or members by their by their writing. Response? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We believe that kids in this province should be in school. We know it is in their best interest that they're there on Friday and every day throughout the school year without interruption. And we believe, as progressive Conservatives, on behalf of the families we represent, that their kids should be in school without disruption. They should not have to be the casualty of a debate, nor should they have to stay home because of a, in this case, QP's desire to increase compensation by such an astronomical amount and not withdraw their decision to strike on Friday. That will affect millions of people, their working parents in our communities, and the most vulnerable among us. We have an obligation to them to work together to keep them in school. It's why we've offered the, the union a it's why we've offered the union a higher increase in compensation, 10% over four years. It's why we're going to hire more staff, support their benefits and their pensions. But the most important principle of our strategy, Speaker, is keeping. Point of order, the member for or the minister for colleges and universities. Okay, invite everyone this evening to McMaster University's having reception in room 228-230. So everyone is welcome and uh, staff included. Thank you. Go Blues. Scarborough Southwest on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to uh, introduce a spe two special guests to the house uh, today. Our page captain, one of our page captain, Julie Harrop's parents are here. Sabrina Aziz and Chris Harrop's are here. Please welcome them to the house. Thank you very much. To the point of order. Point of order. The member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, speaker, I really just truly want to thank everybody in the House who has reached out to myself and my family. Your kind words, your cards, uh, your showing of support uh, truly has meant a lot, and we appreciate it. So I just wanted to say thank you. being no further business this morning. This house stands in recess until 1 p.m.